So um, welcome. Thank you so much for coming and, and attending our debate program. Uh, my name is Rick Anderson. I'm the university librarian at Brigham Young University. Um, and I'm going to explain how our program is going to work today. So um, this is a formal debate. It's loosely structured on uh, Oxford Union debates. And uh, the way it works is like this. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to poll the audience um, and we're going to ask you to register your agreement or disagreement with the proposition, which is resolved, transformative agreements represent the best possible mechanism for a full transition to open access publishing. And then I'll record the result of the vote. And then we will hear 10 minute opening statements from each of our debaters, uh, whom I will take the opportunity to introduce now. So our first will be Carrie Webster, who is Vice President of Open Access at Springer Nature, and she will be arguing in favor of the proposition. We'll then hear from Stephen Kuster, who is Head of Public Affairs for Frontiers, and he will be arguing against the proposition. Then following the opening statements, each of our debaters will offer a three-minute response to the other, and then uh, I, I'll point out that out of fairness to everyone, we're going to observe the time limits very strictly. Um, following the two three-minute responses, we'll then open the floor to questions and comments. And then as we get close to the end of our, uh, of our time, we will repeat the survey. And whichever side has moved the most votes will be declared the winner. Now here it's important to note, sometimes people get confused by this. The, the person with whom the majority of attendees agree at the end of the session will not necessarily be the debate winner. It's the person who moved the most votes to their side. Um, and then one last important note before we begin. Um, if you register a vote during the opening survey, it's very important that you also register a vote during the closing survey. And if you don't register a vote during the opening survey, please don't register a vote during the closing survey. Obviously, this is not gonna be scientifically perfect, but to the degree that our two surveys can represent a poll of the exact same audience, that's, that's what we're going for. Um, so with that, um, I will activate the poll, and it, this is in small uh, type on the screen. You may not be able to see it, but if you go to slido.com um, and enter the code 2442144, uh, you will be able to vote, and we should be able to see the results in real time. So we'll give you a minute. Again, go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O, and enter the code 2442144 to participate. And this is always the awkward pause in these presentations when normally I invite someone from the audience to sing a song or something while the votes come in. I'm looking at you, Bob Boise. Two four four two one four four is the code at slido.com. I need somebody up here with the magic with the magic. I need John King from CNN with the magic board here. <laughs> or Harry Enton, he's better. All right, I'm gonna give it five more seconds and then call it. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, 65% disagree, 35% agree. And with that, I am not used to using a PC. With that, I'll turn it over to Carrie Webster. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's gonna be a tough crowd, I see. But let me see how I do. Can everyone hear me okay, first of all? Okay. Transformative agreements represent the best possible mechanism for a full transition to open access publishing. So what do we mean by full, and what do we mean by best in this context? For me, this is not about the most simplistic way. It's not about the fastest route to flip journals, regardless of impact. It's about the most achievable way to achieve real and sustainable transition, recognizing the very global multifaceted environment that we're in. 
To enable a transition, we need a mechanism that gives authors the choice in publication outlets that they have now, a transition that enables equity for authors in all regions and disciplines, a mechanism that enables space for sustainable transition of funds, and timely preparation for countries and different stakeholders. If that's our aim, what options of mechanisms do we have to deliver a transition? We could do nothing, let authors choose with their feet. We could only support fully OA journals, forcing publishers to flip if they wanted to continue to receive funds. Or we could support a model that can flex to country and customer needs, which is already having demonstrable positive impact on delivering real step change. In other words, transformative agreements. So let's look at these options in turn. Do nothing is too slow. It's not going to bring about meaningful change. Only supporting fully away journals and trying to force an overnight transition. It is an interesting idea, but is it realistic? How could you orchestrate something like this globally, even within a consortia? What happens to regions, disciplines, and authors left behind? Is it fair, is it realistic to assume all institutions and regions are ready with the infrastructure to switch overnight to managing APCs when historically they've been focused on managing access? Is funding in place to make such a, an approach sustainable by forcing a sudden change upon established current payers, the libraries, you risk not allowing the timely um, and necessary mechanisms of bringing in further funding sources, i.e. the research funders, which are really key to enabling long-term open access. Publishers aren't the only stakeholders adapting for the transition. Move too soon and you're going to leave out some parties and authors unsupported and others absorbing a lot of fallout. This doesn't mean that I don't think fully away journals don't require further support. I started at Biomed Central, one of the first open access publishers. I am a career-long OA advocate, and Springer Nature has nearly 600 fully open access journals. Can we do better at organizing funding for these? Yes, absolutely. But they are already in the end state of a transition in the fully open access. And OA journals are already growing successfully, 14% year on year. Frontiers is growing 50% year on year. If the question, though, is how to successfully trans transition, we need to consider the best mechanism for moving hybrid and subscription journals, which currently represent 65% of output. That's the focus. How do we move from where we are now to a fully OA future? So this leaves us with a model and mechanism that acknowledges things are complicated but can still drive real change, and that is transformative agreements. Transformative agreements retain choice of journals for researchers. They support and enable open access across all disciplines. They enable the reallocation of funds towards OA and support stakeholders in preparing for open access. They allow institutions, consortia, countries to transition at a pace and a structure that makes most sense for them. And they are working, they are delivering the transition and they can deliver step change. Let me talk a little bit about these points. What do I mean by choice for researchers? Researchers are not choosing where they publish because the journal is OA or not. Then they're choosing it because they've identified it's the right home for their manuscript. This could be because the scope best represents their community, it could be because it offers the best service, the fastest turnaround time, or they believe it will pr provide the best impact and reach potential. Springer Nature author survey results show us that 90% of authors choose a journal because of journal reputation and relevance to their discipline, whereas the option to publish OA is rated as important by less than 40%. 60% agree they will submit their to the best journal for their work, regardless of whether it is OA. So if you demand a researcher only publishes in a fully OA journal, you risk removing a lot of author choice. Or if a journal flips, but the researcher hasn't got organized funding, you remove author choice. There's no consistent data on, on flipping right now, and the outcomes can really vary by discipline. But our own research of the market shows that 
publications dropped by somewhere around 50% after a flip. 50% of authors who previously chose a journal no longer being easily able to publish there. What do I mean about supporting disciplines? Transformative agreements are proven to provide equity across disciplines. If you look at research disciplines in fully OA, it's been the STEM subjects where we see the highest volume. Humanities and social sciences slower to adopt open access journals. 90% of fully OA publications are from STEM, while only 10% are from humanities and social sciences partly due to the nature of research, but also because funding availability, lower grant levels, just points to the fact that some disciplines are gonna be easier to transition. And if you look at the impact of OA within a transformative agreement, you can see huge jumps in OA uptake across all disciplines within an institution, consortia, country, because the transformative agreement has created an OA level playing field for everyone. Spring and Nature Humanities Social Science Journals see much higher OA uptake from countries where we have transformative agreements to those without. For example, 88% of our German humanities social science content is gold open access. Compare that with 23% of OA in Japan, 5% in China where we don't have transformative agreements. Whether you're a medieval history scholar, work in stem cell research, within a transformative agreement, you can have your APC centrally supported and make the research immediately accessible. So what do I mean when I say transformative agreements enable funding streams and at a pace for all? The number of TAs is growing fast, but one of the reasons it's not even faster is because funding streams can be complicated and they are different by country, consortia, can require different approaches to ensure long-term stability. But transformative agreements help manage that transition of funds and really start the thinking process about further enablement of funds. If I give you some examples in the UK, you can see funders contributing directly to institutions additional funds to support their OA policy. And these can become part of the funding total for transformative or OA agreements. You can see other mechanisms across Europe. In the US, University of California recognized that they couldn't receive funds directly from funders, but they created a multi-payer model with publishers to enable and encourage grant monies to be used alongside library funds. Our experience shows that funding landscape is different across regions, and lots of activity is happening, but it is complicated, and stakeholders need to move at a pace that is sustainable for them. Pace really is the key. If we flipped all of our journals tomorrow, you could imagine many European authors would be okay, but many other researchers globally would not be. So my last point for transformative agreements is simple. They are working. If you look at the regional output from those early adopter countries, you can see that transformative agreements are enabling country level flips. For example, Netherlands, Sweden, both early adopters of transformative agreements are publishing 63%, 65% of their total output gold OA, compared to in the US, 31% of content open access. I think a frustration with transformative agreements can be that they're seen as moving slowly, but I think that's because transitioning generally is complicated, and I think that all of us stakeholders in the transition have been learning and developing our approach. More recently, you can see significant increases in the volume of TAs. Around 300 agreements reached last year from over 40 different publishers. And in 2022, 280 year to date, but way beyond Europe now, we've got some in Africa, Latin America, Middle East, Asia Pacific, 93 this year in North America. Steal a last sentence. The transition is happening. And if we continue to support TAs, we'll continue. Thank you, Rick. And thank you, Carrie, for laying down the gauntlet. It's great to see such an engaged audience today. Hello. 
when I was thinking about the case against the motion, I found a clue in those two words, best possible. The motion is that transformative agreements represent the best possible mechanism for a full transition to open access. Now, without being too philosophical about this, how can they be the best possible mechanism? These agreements are a market mechanism, and the market only ever chooses what's best for the market. Now, regardless of your view of market economics, surely that's a very narrow definition of success. Not least because the worldwide scientific publishing market is an oligopoly. The market is estimated at around 27 billion US dollars and is dominated by the five largest paywall publishing houses, who between them have captured more than half of it. Transformative agreements are securing that market dominance in part by controlling the pace of transition to a full open access system. Because at their heart, most of these agreements are large scale region, read and publish or hybrid deals. Transformative agreements with legacy publishers will often allow authors to appear in these uh, hybrid journals without being charged as long as their institutions pay. And all the while, legacy publishers are maintaining the amount of science that is published behind paywalls. It's a complex and opaque approach that comes with no contractual commitment to a full move to open access in a binding deadline. Look at Europe, for example. More than half of the 2,000 transformative journals enrolled in the Coalition S program for open access are falling short of their own targets in that move to full open access. So I would argue transformative agreements are the best possible market mechanism for legacy publishers in the transition to open access, in as much as they slow the pace of change. And that's only right. Any sensible business facing rapid changes in a digitalized world would pursue the same course of action to maintain market share. But unfortunately, this legacy thinking is holding back social progress. We face global existential threats from health emergencies to climate change. These threats can be managed and reversed, but that's going to depend on political will, global collaboration, and scientific breakthroughs at a scale we have not yet seen. And all of those, on all of those counts, success will rest heavily on the widespread sharing of the latest scientific knowledge. All of it. As the COVID emergency taught us, when we trust, open, and share scientific res research globally, we can mobilize, innovate, and save lives. But now we need to do more. At Frontiers, we want to see all science open so that scientists can collaborate better and innovate faster for fairer outcomes in all parts of society. That's our social purpose as a business. The public pays for billions of dollars of scientific research every year, and two thirds of, it, of its results are locked behind publishing paywalls, forcing taxpayers to pay again. This is science for the few, not for the many. So let's ask ourselves, who does this motion serve? Transformative agreements represent the best possible mechanism for a full transition to open access. Mm. The best possible mechanism for authors, not if these agreements maintain the olig oligopoly that limits competition, not if they curtail author choice or maintain high prices, and certainly not if they prevent the fullest possible access to our collective knowledge to enhance scientific impact and boost research collaboration. In the end, there is no evidence that these transformative agreements are spurring or sharing better science, and there is no evidence that the paywall science they help maintain outperforms science that's published fully open access. Indeed, the research published in fully open access journals regularly inspires more, more citations across the scientific community than it does behind paywalls. Four fully open access publishers rank among the world's most cited, and the world's top three subscription publishers on this count are monodisciplinary publishers. So in fact, the two top disciplinary, multidisciplinary publishers in the world are fully open access. All science publishers face the same reputational risk to keep up quality. Authors prize their reputations and they vote with their feet. So fully open access publishing is still dwarfed by paywall and hybrid publishing, but it is growing and popular in popularity and awareness. So again, let's ask ourselves, who does the motion serve? 
the best possible mechanism for libraries and their institutions, not if these agreements come with inflated prices, not if they overwhelm institutions' publishing budgets in multi-year deals, leaving little funding for authors who seek open access options, and certainly not if they come with opaque, complex bundles of services, making it all but impossible for users, libraries, and funders to understand the value of individual components. Now, the costs of science publishing vary from company to company, but on average, per article, fully open access publishing comes in at a lower price than paywall publishing. And it is much less expensive than the hybrid option in transformative agreements. In my view, fully open access journals offer greater value for money to universities, libraries, funders, and ultimately the taxpayer. So once more, let's ask ourselves, who does this motion serve? The best possible mechanism for society at large? Not if we believe global challenges demand urgent action backed by full and immediate access to our collective knowledge. And certainly not if we believe that the integrity of published research is as important as a democratic way in which it is shared. It is clear that here in the US, the Biden administration has put fairness at the heart of its new policy guidance. It is seeking free and equitable access to federally funded scientific research without embargo with a binding deadline. The degree to which transformative agreements meet that challenge should be our measure of their success. In the end, I would argue transformative agreements are putting a break on the transition to fully accessible science. They help maintain published science behind the paywall. They compare poorly with full, fully open access publishing agreements on cost, transparency, scientific impact, author choice, taxpayer fairness, and funder value for money. They perpetuate science for the few rather than enlarging it for the many. And ultimately, one cannot say these agreements are the best possible mechanism for full transformation to open access because a better, better alternatives already exist fully open and working now. They represent a better way and they don't rely on promises of transformation tomorrow. Pure open access publishers have a model that is good for society, is commercially viable, economically sustainable, and allows us to publish robust science that is open for all. Pure open access publishers have proven that they can succeed at scale. Publishing articles that are fully open on day one in a variety of useful formats ready for download, use, and reuse to drive the knowledge economy. And scale matters. Breakthroughs will depend not just on incremental access to individual pieces of research. With machine readability, publishing at scale will be key as new technologies accelerate discovery through ingesting large volumes of articles. And of course, pure open access publishers are innovating publishing. Drawing on the power of digital scholarly communication in the 21st century, to disseminate knowledge, build new tools, offer greater author choice, and present transparency on costs and conditions. One of the most frequently repeated propositions in the recent open access debate is that, quote, there is enough money in the system to fund the transition to open access. Yes, but that funding can only be unlocked with public sector, policymaker, and buyer leadership if we look beyond legacy models and their providers that have been responsible for a decades-long cost explosion in scholarly publishing. And that leadership will be key to building and maintaining public trust in science. Because when public trust in science is fragile, scientific authority comes not just from the evidence, but from the public consensus around it. And that consensus will be easier to maintain when the latest scientific knowledge is globally shared and translated, free to read and open to all. Greater collective knowledge will drive better collective action, and it will help meet public appetite for political accountability, transparency, and trust. Thank you. Thanks for that. Let's be clear, this is not a debate about whether OA is the end goal, about whether OA is beneficial or the best way for publishing. We are fully agreed on that, but this is about how do we move. So I'm gonna start my rebuttal actually with a, a, a point of agreement on what Stephen's, Stephen said. In considering this motion, the clue is in the words, best possible. 
And I agree, possible, what is possible? What is achievable? What's the most realistic way to enable a transition? It's very clear, the views that you don't like transformative agreements, but I didn't feel that we really had a realistic alternative. Fully OA journals is where we need to be. No argument on the end destination, but we have to be practical about how do we transition the rest. And to my previous arguments, without leaving authors, countries, libraries unprepared. I'd really like to challenge the notion that transformative agreements being a market mechanism and the market choosing what it wants, and that is to slow down the transition. It's categorically not true. Firstly, the sentiment implies that publishers are the market and have forced these models upon their customers, when in fact we develop the models with libraries responding to requests to move funds to enable OA, but maintain access to the content that was still subscription. And actually, incidentally, there's a really great example. There's a, um, a session at four o'clock with Max Planck and Nature to talk about how we developed a model together, recognizing things were challenging. So useful to see how it, it's developed in partnership rather than, than forced. That we're slowing down the transition is also just false. Individual take up for OA without transformative agreements is just slow. Authors won't choose OA if they don't have ease of funding or a mandate to do it. So if we flip a journal without a high OA share, before the, the region, the author is ready, we do risk failing. But then we have transformative agreements. Let's use Germany again as an example where we do have an agreement. 86% of Springer Nature content with a German author is published gold open access, enabled through the agreements. From the hybrid portfolio, that's 9,000 articles a year that were previously published subscription that are now published gold open access. That is a huge step change that would not have happened if we'd allowed, encouraged the authors just by themselves without a coordinating funding. Transformative, the transition is slow and definitely slower than OA advocates like myself included would like, but it's not because transformative agreements are slow, it's because the transition and getting ready for it is complex. We're on a path and we're not there yet, but there is a path. If the proposition was, let's do something achievable, okay, subscriptions, were achievable, hybrid seems to be achievable, but I think the proposition should be let's do something better. Look, I, I don't doubt the sincerity of the commitments to change by many large mixed model publishers. What I'm missing is a clear answer to the question, how long is long enough? Currently, transformative agreements are a net negative in search for a future positive. How many years is that notional payback period? 20 years in, are we really still moving too soon? In the eyes of policymakers, enough time has passed and transformative agreements are not meeting the objectives in their eyes and we agree with them. And it's worth remembering that open access is not only about current and future content and that while transformative agreements may be slowly addressing openness of some of that content, much historical research remains locked away and we are not talking about deep history either. On funding, Carrie points out that the need facing institutions and agencies to manage funding streams carefully, and she's right to do so. But it is entirely in the hands of those institutions and agencies to set the funding policies and allocations they want. There is enough money in the system to fund the transition to full open access publishing. It can be unlocked with buyer leadership and willingness to change, to change not only the way you pay the few incumbents, from subscription fees to par fees to APCs, for instance, but using it to allow new publishers to enter into partnerships with libraries and provide innovation and cost-effective services. You can either choose to distribute money to sustain legacy publishing models, or you can use that money instead to achieve openly distributed and shared knowledge. Let me close with an analogy from the car industry. If the goal is to shift from fossil fuels to electric vehicles, a hybrid isn't the best possible mechanism. A hybrid vehicle will never become an electric vehicle. It's not in a state of transformation, it's stuck. Thank you.
need to turn off the timer here. <laughs> well, thanks so much to uh, both Carrie and uh, Stephen for their excellent uh, opening statements and responses. And we will now um, uh, open the floor to questions and comments. Elena has a mic. Uh, because I believe we do have some remote attendees, it would be great if you could hold your comment until you have the mic in hand. So um, raise your hand if you would like the mic. Hi, I'm Colleen Campbell from the Max Planck Digital Library, the Open Access 2020 initiative. Mine is really a comment, and perhaps it's <laughs> to you, Rick, as the moderator of this session. And the comment is that I think the proposition is fundamentally faulty, because um, if we're talking about an open access transition, we're talking about uh, the, the scholarly communication in it broadly. Where do authors publish? And if we can look at data presented in the ESAC Markin Watch, we can see that authors publish in the journals of, um, uh, shall we call them legacy publishers that are subscription-based and that are on their way to transitioning to open access. And they publish in fully open access journals of publishers like Frontiers. They publish in diamond journals. They publish in a multitude, uh, a diversity of journals and publishing venues. So I think it is faulty to say, what is the best way forward? Um, I personally find that transformative agreements are uh, an instrument that enable institutions, libraries in particular, um, together with their authors and their, their administrators to um, approach the open access transition, which ultimately goes to benefit fully open access publishers and also diamond journals because um, it's a way to starting with what is the highest impact, you know, where the greatest number of articles are published, you know, that's a way to begin, and then you look up and you see, you know, the multitude of publishing venues that authors use, and can establish an approach, an institutional approach, to prepare for an open paradigm, which is coming, right? So I, th I would argue that we need to embrace as institutions all these publishing venues for our authors. So it sounds like you. It sounds like you disagree with the proposition, but you disagree with it. You disagree with its premise. Got it. Okay. Uh, there's one here, and then one there, and then one there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Angela Gibson, MLA. Um, Stefan, you didn't mention the humanities once, and so I would be interested to hear, given your position, um, how you think humanities and other uh, very unfunded uh, fields could transition to open access in the absence of read and publish deals. Right. Thank you for that uh, for that question. Um, Plan S also doesn't mention humanities a, a great deal, um, especially in in the beginning. Um, that probably has to do with some specific uh, characteristics of the field. One of those uh, characteristics is that it is usually an underfunded field. Um, so we're talking about the problem of funding overall and not the, the funding available for, 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 for publishing. My argument is that if you move away from big deal or transformative agreement type of, um, uh, of, of an environment, the money in the system becomes available, among other things, for research and to nourish communities and, and disciplines that aren't as funded as, uh, as others. What we, make, what we have to make sure is that when that happens, and the when is, that's the big question in the room here, but when that happens, that that money stays in research and is in use for you know, the football team or, um, so that's, it's a partial answer, it's not the full answer. Um, to add another only partial element to it is that we probably have to concede that those factors that make the humanities and some other fields different. Um, require exceptions, like Plan S did in Europe for, you know, the timeline is extended for, for the humanities and some social sciences. The type of license uh, may be different. Uh, you, you may be talking about CC BY non-commercial or non-derivative for some fields. So I think it's, these things have to be thought through at a granular enough level to allow for the specificities of the, of the disciplines, specifically the humanities. 
And of course, depending on, on what you believe the correct definition of open access is, you may be talking about exceptions to an open access transition. There, there are many who would argue that CCBYND is not open access. Yeah, I would argue that. Yeah. But I will just uh, jump in. I know the question wasn't to me, but just to emphasize, this is where transformative agreements, and to Colleen's point, it does allow you to at least lock in some kind of structure and for libraries to prepare themselves for open access payments. And we do need that if we want to make sure that all disciplines, and especially those lower funded, really have the infrastructure in the future. James Rhodes, Virginia Tech Libraries. Sorry, this seems very loud. Um, <laughs> <coughs> sorry about that. So my, my big question is kind of along the same line points uh, of the, the first one there, but more comprehensive. If not transformative agreements, then what? How do, you, how do you do it? I mean, at least with transformative agreements, it gives you something to, to go off of. I'll take that first. Um, full open access is, a, is an option. We, we publish full open access. We don't have transformative agreements. We, no, we don't need to be transformed. Our content is open on, on, on day one. And I'm not arguing for that to be the only alternative out there. We need a diverse uh, landscape. And um, Colleen mentioned diamond open access. There's, there's different ways of getting where we, where we want to get. The point is that the one model into which so much energy financial attention, policy attention is being put, is not the model that is getting us there the quickest. Um, but if you want to, the answer to how we do it otherwise, I think gold open access is the, is the way to go, uh, full gold open access. I guess I would follow up with the question of like, but specifically, how do you do that? Flipping is not the only way to transition. A transition can, only mean, can also mean you close down journals and you start new journals with new publishers that offer the new model. Uh, a society can, the only way to generate revenue for a society is not only through subscriptions. We, we, we offer, we work for societies, we have societies as clients and we, we publish for them and they have an APC model. So it, it, it can be done. It's really a matter of the funding flows and allowing them to go where the innovative models are instead of locking them in into multi-year hyper-bundled agreements. I'd just make a comment that on transformative agreements, like I feel like it, we're saying that it's one model, and it's really not. I think there really is a variety depending on what the publication output is, depending what the funding structure is, even the tax structure in some countries. So there is like a lot of layers between when we say transformative agreements. Okay, uh, two comments, one question. Can you um, tell us who, uh, who you are and what oh, you're Sorry, from? Frank Helwig, uh, uh, Working for Frontiers Institutional Partnerships Manager. So um, the what first comment is with regard to the humanities, yeah, the question implies that the transformative agreements solve that problem and the fully open access agreements do not solve that problem. That is not right, yeah? I mean, it was implied only, no one said it explicitly, uh, admittedly. But it's, it's, it's not right, yeah? So if you would have a fully open access agreement for a big country, um, uh, then it would just be paid for as with the transformative agreements Springer Nature has in place. So, it, so it's not solved with either. either. Or if it's solved, it could be solved with either. Yeah, so it's uh, one comment. Then also want to quickly, second comment, the Germany example is a little bit um, shaky, yeah? Because you compare two scenarios. You compare the scenario that you, you, I mean, Springer Nature or Wiley or uh, whatever big legacy publisher has such a deal in place, or the second scenario that you don't have such a deal in place, but you forget exactly the third scenario Stefan tried to, or Stefan and others um, c convey that there, it, there would be an, a scenario where you basically like uh, free up that money, yeah, and make it publisher neutrally available to all authors to actually choose, yeah, because currently this is not really, um, happening yeah but this uh, i want to keep it with the comments here and now a genuine interest yeah and there is a thesis uh, out for a couple of years at least yeah that the transformative agreements don't work um to transition fully yeah uh, what the thesis says here simply because uh, they themselves obviously make a lot of uh, content open access which in turn with all other big deals or any subscription agreements you have in place in other countries 
of this the increases the share of open access and de therefore devaluates these, your other revenue stream, which is still, of course, still 70, 80%, I guess, yeah? So how do you deal with that, yeah? Wouldn't there be an incentive to slow down rather the, the transition because uh, otherwise uh, you would overall like uh, uh, in a planned uh, process decrease year by year your revenue and lose customers on, on the other end, yeah? In other parts where you don't have transformative agreements. Um, I'll, I'll make two uh, comments in response. One on, you know, the Germany scenario or big publishers locking others out. I feel like, I, I don't think that that's true what's happening. I said there was this year like hundreds of agreements with 40 published different publishers doing it. Um, your own colleague presented yesterday, I think Frontiers is eight national agreements, 650 institutions um, tied up in agreements. So things are happening. But it's not crazy that if you're trying to get your head around how to move funding, that you would start with where you can make the biggest impact So, and where your authors are going to make that transition. So I, I think it's just a matter of timing, and you can see that with all these other agreements coming up. It's not just a pure lock-in. Um, then the, the point about, I, I think you're saying, is that we're just going to be motivated to kind of keep subscription revenue going as long as, as possible. And I just, our customers, and we are committed to open access. Like, that is a, it's just a fact that that is a better way to do it. And I don't think our customers or our authors would let that happen. We are in a transition, and it is hard when, you know, Subscription output continues to grow. China, um, other countries, like hugely leading with research outputs, are growing um, double digits, and we need them to get on board with open access too. That's how we really start shifting it, but that's what I mean. We have a mechanism, we go country by country where it makes sense, and we show the benefits, and then we get the others to come on board with us. Hi, um, Amy Harris from MIT Press. And for those of you who have been in a few sessions with me, I swear this isn't the only thing I talk about. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, we've just finished in this room hearing from Dr. Mambo Tata about the importance of equity in these models. And I take umbrage with the idea that read and publish is equitable because by going institution by institution, um, authors who aren't lucky enough to be at an institution that can afford to be in one of these read and publish agreements, which come with such amazing overhead of um, you know, having to deal with reporting and payments and APCs, they're not able to participate in this system and we are leaving people out. This is not an equitable and inclusive way forward. You can look to examples like Scope 3, the magnificent work that CERN has done. Um, you know, it's a long-standing OA model. Uh, it is, it, that's, it's pretty cumbersome, but um, also, I have to applaud the work of the folks at PLOS for pioneering the collective action publishing model, CAP, and the folks at Annual Reviews for using Subscribe to Open, which is an incredibly, brilliantly genius way of transitioning subscription spend to open access funding. These are publishers that are making moves today, not to mention the scholar-led publishers, the born away publishers who are thriving and making this work. So. Um, I, I commend the two of you for covering these areas and also for um, highlighting the, um, the issue of the humanities because I do think that that's an area that um, you, we have to pay attention to. I think that Subscribe to Open and um, CAP have the, the potential to really um, fund humanities, open access publication. Um, and I, I'll give it to Read and Publish. It's doing a great job of, um, of including humanities and social sciences um, scholars who have chronically been underfunded within this situation of you know, being able to publish open access. Thank you. Do you want to respond? Um, I, I really thank you for bringing up that, that issue because I think equity and supporting um, those uh, countries, um, whether we say global self or global south, lower um, income countries where, yeah, it, Transformative agreements are not perfect, and I think we it definitely we haven't kind of got that. Uh, you don't see it really as established um, in those regions right now, and I, I think that's totally fair. What I see and what we're doing is recognizing what I said about different models, that you have to have a different approach and recognize that things are different. But what I would say about that is I don't think we've got it right in fully away yet 
either. Like we, on our journals, have um, a waiver program. We waived about 18 million euros in APCs last year for those with an inability to pay. But waivers aren't a nice mechanism either. It's not right. So I guess what I would say is I don't think that's a transformative agreement problem. I think that's a transition problem. And I think broadly we've still got things to work out there. So it's my time to agree with, with Carrie um, that we, we haven't solved the equity issue either. Um, and uh, there's a risk with the APC model that you, you remove one barrier and you, you, you build up an, a, another one. Um, that's a risk we don't want to take and we, we don't want to uh, you know, move uh, in that direction. Yes, waivers are not a perfect mechanism, but they are a mechanism. But I think in the end, in, the, in, in this debate, if we're comparing two approaches, uh, and we, we look at those through the lens of equity, there is one that is vastly less equitable uh, because it puts a restriction to access and to reading. And I think that is the contribution to equity. Um, it's, not, it's by far not solved the problem, but I think that is uh, wh where open access is per se a more equitable uh, model. This is not necessarily a point about transformative agreement. It's open access versus paywall. But. Allison. Hello, I'm Alicia Wise from Information Power, and we do work to help smaller societies. Alicia, would you society. move the mic up closer to your mouth? I can. Is that better? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay. So I'm Alicia Wise from Information Power, and we help support, amongst others, smaller society publishers to transition to open access. And I just wanted to call out work uh, done with Eiffel to, end to, to help uh, transformative agreements happen between those society publishers and universities in Albania, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Congo, Ethiopia, Ghana, Ivory Coast, Kenya, Kosovo, Kyrgyzstan, Laos, Lesotho, Malawi, Maldives, Myanmar, Nepal, and others. Researchers in these countries are affiliated with universities who have libraries who in many cases already have agreements with publishers, either directly or through their consortia or through organizations like Research for Life. Transformative agreements can be an inclusive way of increasing equity. So I would just challenge that debate um, a, a little bit that we've just heard. Thanks, Alicia. Other comments? Oh, Fatina. Hi, I'm Athena Hepner from the University of Central Florida, and I work in acquisitions. I deal with a lot of our electronic resource packages and invoices, and we have a couple of transformative agreements. And I can tell you, when the authors find them, they're very excited to be able to waive that $3,000 APC and publish open access in the journal they already selected. So that's wonderful, but... Um, it's problematic because we can't afford it. We only go for transformative agreements if it's cost neutral to the library acquisitions budget, not the university budget, because we don't have the rest of the university budget. So how do you get over that hump to make this a better model? Or the other problem is if it's a diamond OA or something like that, we don't have a fund to help with the APCs for that. So unless the author planned in advance to have it grant funded how do you deal with that? So what are the practical steps to make these models more appealing for a university and their authors? Thank you for the question. I mean, I would say that that's the, the challenge for the OA transition generally, right? If you're a high output university, um, high research output, the library doesn't have all the funds to cover it. That's that's just a, a fact. So it's really about how can we enable and bring in um, other funding streams like there are NIH allows funds to be used towards open access publishing if the researchers put it in the grant up front so how do we encourage make sure that kind of that is captured and that if you've got an agreement actually it's the authors that don't have funds that can use your monies and those that that do have it can can go elsewhere so I think there's education there's trying to work with the funders there's it's hard in the US because it's not, there's definitely no kind of direct um, communication. And I, I think that's what we have to keep working on, which is why, you know, the University of California, multi-payer, seeing how that evolves, if you can try and like bring together multiple sources, it's interesting, but it's complicated. 
and and it and it's uh, it's less it's less complicated at a system like California, which basically functions like a European country, than it would be <laughs> than it would be at a, a system of higher education in another yeah. state. Steve, but that's exactly the argument for letting the money flow where authors want it to be used. So you should be able to use the same budget you have for agreements with open access with an open access publisher or to, to support authors in other models. Um, and the fact that so much of your budget is tied up in subscription deals is preventing, that's probably the reason why it's preventing you from, from, from doing that. Um, so that's the first thing we have to solve. We, if there is true competition for this funding and the authors get support regardless of the business model of the journal that they want to publish in, then we're on an equal playing field and that's, that's, that's what we want. Adam there also from the uh, Max Planck Digital Library. Stefan, thank you for that argument because now, I don't know if you realize, but you've just argued for uh, transformative agreements um, because in, in our view, uh, it really is a mechanism for, for the library budget to follow the authors and it, is, it shouldn't be the library who should be like, you know, saying the authors that you should publish only in these journals, uh, but we should allow authors in publishing in their journal of choices and then have mechanisms in our budgets um, to follow that. And I, I wanted to react actually on Tina's point uh, here, uh, like the colleague from Florida, is that it's what we say always and what Carrie also mentioned is that there is, and Stefan did that too, that there is enough money in the system. Um, and there are cases really when, when we see that uh, the publishing output is, is comparatively higher than the previous subscription fees. Um, but there are also cases um, where, we, where we can realize savings um, for like compared to the previous subscription fees. And in those cases where we, we um, how do you say, it? We, we liberate our budgets uh, with signing these transformative agreements and divesting from those subscriptions where we are historically over-invested. And then um, the budgets can follow the authors by publishing in Frontiers, uh, supporting diamond models such as uh, MIT, SciPost, um, these sort of things. So like, I, I also would argue that transformative agreements are also a mechanism to free up and liberate the budget and then reinvest it where it's needed. The, the key word there being where it's needed and where, where the authors want to go. So uh, a, a big transformative agreement that just changes the way you pay the same publisher the same amount of money, actually an increasing amount of money. That's, that's, I don't see how that is helping. So, uh, it's not locked in. It's not locked in. It is locked in in many cases. I mean, look at Project Deal in, in Germany. That is the... No, no, that's the exact same. Not the same. In Project Deal, the publisher makes a, a, earns a fee for the authors to publish. There is nothing that says you have to publish X amount of volume. Yeah, but there is no much, not much money left for the librarians, for, 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 other, for consortia to sign agreements with other publishers because so much of the funding is going down this route. Well, it is in that deal. It, it, it is a guaranteed amount. Okay, I think we've got time for one last question or comment. Okay. My name is Chris Palazzolo. I'm the head of collections at Emory in Atlanta. Um, and I will kind of disagree with the divesting um, and not divesting so much about freeing up the money. A lot of my money is in big bundles and in big packages. And so therefore, my, for, when, for me to afford things like Frontiers and PLOS, I need to divest from the legacy publishers and big bundles. But my content, my, my more bigger comment though is, I think it's a little bit disingenuous to say that it's not a market mechanism because of the fact that, and I'm not, and I'm not saying that as a negative, um, and you are working with libraries to find the best market mechanism that works for you and for the libraries to keep your, your income coming in, whether it comes from APCs or from legacy subscriptions and so forth. I think, and I'm glad you're working with us because we're part of the market, you were customers, so we can find the best mechanism. But to say that's purely not a market mechanism to try to make that work, um, and again, it's not a slight. You're a publisher, you need to make money. You need to think that's not, I understand how publishing works um, generally. So I just wanna kind of make that, it's not, again, not a slight. It's just, I think, and I'm glad you're including us because we're finding, you know, there is not a pure market here, obviously. We're involved in that market. 
Thank you. Cool. Yeah, thank we you have for to that. respond very, very briefly. Yeah, thank you for that comment. I wasn't meaning to say it's not a market mechanism. It was just that we solely are not the market, and I was meaning that it's a collective. Thank you. Thank you so much. Would you please join me in thanking our debaters one more time? Okay, I'm going to activate the poll again, and, and again, I'm going to repeat. If you voted at the beginning of the session, please vote again. If you did not vote at the beginning of the session, please don't vote now. So go to slido.com. The, uh, the code is 244144. Son of a... And I am... Nope. Okay. Um, it didn't... Hang on. Why did it not... Okay, now, please vote. Again, slido.com, code 242144. And while the votes are coming in, I'm, I'm just going to um, take the opportunity to make a quick editorial comment. One of the reasons that I continue organizing and moderating debates like this, and I feel this especially strongly today, is that what Stephen and Carrie have just modeled for us is civil, respectful, and rational discourse between people who, who deeply disagree. Thank you for that. Wow. Oh, okay. I was going to say that was very quick. So at the beginning, we had 35% who agreed and 65% who disagreed. And with the voting slowing down, it appears that agree has won. So congratulations, Carrie. Thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of the conference.